the Jesus table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry call it now, come and dine. Soon the Lamb will take his bride to be ever at his side. All the host of heaven will assemble be. Oh, it will be a glorious sight, all the saints in spotless white, and with Jesus they will feast eternally. Come and dine, the Master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine, to the hungry calleth now, come and dine. Thank you. You may be seated. All right. Well, this time I'd like to just take some moments and go through my vacation pictures with you. <laughs> Amen. You're like, oh boy. All right. No, I'd like to spend some time just kind of giving you a, a little bit of a report from our Paris Olympics project. Of course, this is one of our Project World events that we we've done. The kind of what I call the all-encompassing ministry when it comes to our missions. And uh, the desire was during this time frame to evangelize the world that was coming to Paris. Now, Paris already has much of the world coming to it. It's one of the most visited cities of the world. But it was unique because the Olympics were there. And that draws so many people. They, they, from what I read, there was supposed to be between 10 to 15 million that would cycle through the city at any given time. And when we were there, there were certainly a lot of people. We saw lots of areas that was just people were constantly flowing through. And it's a very large city. About 12 million live in the region itself, about 3 Point one or something like that, live in Paris Central. It's a very compact area. And uh, anyway, so we had some tremendous opportunities with the gospel itself to be able to evangelize and talk to people and, and, and things like that. And just to kind of give you some of the statistics, if you haven't been following the Project World page that had that, but during our time, uh, we distributed over 25,000 gospel tracts. You know, that that's quite a bit, you know, especially considering well, we, the amount we had rejected. In other words, where we say, hey, can we give you one? No, thank you, whatever. We had, we had many times where that took place. If everybody took it, it would probably be about three times that number that we came across, I'm willing to bet. It was, there was a lot of rejection, but we, we told people, hey, look, just keep, just keep asking. Just keep asking, and then all of a sudden you get, you get some people that would take them, and eventually it, it works up, and, and we got a, several of those passed out. And uh, also one of the things we prayed about, one of the specific prayers, is that because the world was coming there, we wanted to reach the world. And uh, the prayer was that, at the beginning, was that we would get 100 nations, that we would interact with at least one gospel track or personal witness. And um, at first uh, I asked people, you know, do you think this is, I mean, after the fact, did you, how many of you thought it was kind of impossible? And, and we had several people that, that indicated that. But the Lord enabled us to get to uh, reach out and speak to at least 108 people or 108 different countries that were engaged at that time. And, I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, it was an impossibility, but God did it for us. And that was, and you think about it too, we only, we only uh, evangelized for really about a week or so. I mean, you think about the amount of people that we came across in that amount of time. I mean, it's just, it just amazes me. But that's the kind of God that we have who answers prayer when we care about what he cares about. And you know what he cares about? The souls of people and the nations of the world. God's got his eyes upon the souls of people. And, uh, when, you, and when God's work goes forward, he's, he's there right beside you helping us. And we give God all the glory for this. We couldn't have done this on our own. We know that. And, and it was incredible, some of the testimonies that we heard. Uh, maybe share one in particular uh, that was quite a, quite a neat answer to prayer by one of the gals that was on the team. But this was the team itself. Here was a picture of our final day. Uh, Twenty different uh, people from four different churches uh, came together from four different states. And uh, we uh, spent the time together. We, we uh, stayed in a couple Airbnb-type locations. And uh, we, we worked together and uh, for a common cause. And I thank God for the team. They, there was a lot that they had to endure. It was a little warm over there. And, uh, and uh, it was a little, and they don't have air conditioning in many places. And, 
Yeah, we were suffering for Jesus, I know, but you know what? <laughs> you know, I, I hate to say it, but there's been people that have suffered far greater, you know, and, uh, but they worked hard, and I thank God that, for the effort and the spirit that we had amongst the team. It really, it really showed a, a passion for the things of God and, and, and just their desire to do something, and, and I, I pray that each one came back with a renewed vision. Um, with me... Uh, here, the guy in the middle is actually, his name is Pastor Baptist. His actual first name is Baptist Passel. And uh, he pastors a church in, uh, just in a place called Race Oranges, which is uh, just south of Paris. It's kind of a suburb, if you will. And uh, they had a nice congregation there of people. They have, it's very multi-ethnic church. But it runs about 150 people on a Sunday morning, which is pretty big for a French church. I asked him, what's the average size of a church here? And he said about 50 maybe uh, people in an average church around. So I said, you're kind of bigger than, yeah, he said, well, he was very humble about it, but, but uh, he was, that was the first time we'd actually met face to face was when we arrived. And we had a lot of conversation before that. And, and uh, it was, they were, a, they were a help to us. They supplied our meals abundantly. We, we had more food than we could ever eat while we were over there. And then, of course, we had the opportunity to fellowship with them last Sunday. And this was a meal that we, we shared with them and their, co their, their congregational hall and so forth. So we appreciate that. There was a, another missionary. His, his name was Kyle Gouins. He, uh, he was a young missionary, just had gotten to the field for a couple years ago, and uh, he helped us out as well. So I appreciate the, the work that was done by these to help make our, our trip possible. Well, we got there, and uh, of course, we're all dealing with jet lag, and I decided that we need to go to London the next day and uh, get on the, what was called the Eurostar, and uh, what shot us under the English Channel and brought us up into the city of London, and we had an opportunity to do that. The reason we did this right away was because the cost, if I had waited a week, it would have doubled in cost, so we, we decided, I had to decide... Well, we're going we're gonna to take some time at least to visit this city. And outside of Jerusalem, I would say that London is one of the most significant cities of, that, ha, that holds a lot of spiritual heritage for God's people. And uh, there, there's, there's so much history there uh, in, in, from a world sense, but also from a spiritual sense. To give you an idea, uh, I'm here. I thought about building one of these here in our church. <laughs> uh, I put on the robes and the wig and, you know, do all that. But uh, this, is, this is inside of a church that was pastored by John Newton. You know who John Newton is? He's the one who wrote Amazing Grace, a testimony of how God transformed his life from the inside out. He had been a slave trader, very debauched, a, a very blasphemous man. But God saved his soul, changed his life, and became an avid abolitionist in this day. And uh, he was a big influence on a man by the name of William Wilberforce. Uh, if there's a name that you need to know as Christian people, it's William Wilberforce because he was the one that, that out got it passed in the British Empire, the, the annihilation of the slave trade. You know, unfortunately, people like that aren't exalted in our day and age for doing a lot for race relations. He did a lot. And he was a born-again, Bible-believing Christian. They did that. John Newton encouraged him when he was when he was considering giving up on politics. Said, "No, you're in there for a reason. Fulfill your spot." And he spent 40 years fighting for, for against that slave trade, and he won three days before he died. Incredible, isn't it? Because he had a conviction in his heart about uh, about uh, the human race. So, anyways, significant place. Another place, too, was this was the outside of John Wesley's chapel. John Wesley, of course, a predominant preacher in the 1700s during the First Great Awakening. And uh, anyways, his little chapel there that he had purchased next door to it is his house that he had lived in while he was there in London. And what was interesting is that, you know, it's kind of right in the midst of all these different buildings. You know, they're really, they've really kind of crunched down their, <laughs> as far as space around it. They, I don't think the country realizes what they have as far as a, a treasure sitting right there of history. But uh, anyways, it was on the outskirts, uh, outskirts of, of uh, London at the time when it was built, but now it's certainly surrounded by it. The, just behind that chapel is his gravesite there where he was buried. In, uh, and I'm, out, I'm picturing there. Across the street as well is a place called Bunhill, uh, Bunhill uh, Cemetery, or Bunhill Fields, excuse me. It's a cemetery that houses a number of predominant uh, uh, people uh, that uh, were buried there. 
Uh, this grave is the grave of John Bunyan. You know who John Bunyan is? He was the author of Pilgrim's Progress, the second most sold book in the world. Second only to the Bible. The Bible. And uh, he wrote that in a prison cell in, in Bedford, England. Having being, uh, having being jailed for preaching the gospel, if I remember right, for not without a license. You know, there are people that have paid a high price for the faith that we hold. May we not throw our faith away because it's inconvenient. That is one of the things I hope that our group got while we were in, in London because we went by. I didn't get a chance to go to a place called Smithfield, which was a market at a time, but in the 1500s, it was the place where they burnt people at the stake for their faith. That was in the Western world, folks. That sounds a lot like what you would hear in the Middle East amongst ISIS and things like that, but that, that was in the Western world. People pay the price. And uh, sometimes we think that we pay a price for what we do, but, you know, no, there are some people that pay a higher price. We, we got a chance to see outside of uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, the, the bishop there at the time, um, would uh, burn the, the English versions of uh, the scriptures that William Tyndale had translated. You know, remember back in the day, it was only in Latin. The common people didn't have it, but William Tyndale, along with John Wycliffe, were two men in the 14 and 1500s that spent a lot of time trying to get the, lang trying to get the scriptures into the English language, paid, paid for it with their life. Tyndale was burned at the stake, but he prayed, God opened the eyes of the King of England. And it was a few decades later, the, the King of England, James I, allowed for the translation of what we know to be the King James Bible. And uh, so much history and, uh, that exists there. I didn't even get to, we didn't even get to go to all the places that I'd hoped to go when we were there. But um, it reminded me so much of how we are on the shoulders of those who have paid a high price. May we not take our faith so flippantly and give it up so willingly in a day and age that's telling us to shut up. We need to speak out and say, thus saith the Lord on this issue, that issue. And by the way, the most important issue is how to get to heaven. That's the most important thing. And there, these people are just examples of that. And again, we just got a taste while we were over there. But uh, anyways, that was, that was day one. And, <laughs> and uh, after, after we got, got to Paris, and we got back the same day, got kind of late, rested up, and then we kind of hit the streets. And of course, you, I'll, I'll show you a few of the most iconic locations there. You have, of course, the Eiffel Tower, uh, where was a central focus of uh, competitions and things like that. You also have this, this place called the Arc de Triomphe, which is, um, b construction began under Napoleon Bonaparte, but was concluded by uh, one of his, uh, his uh, successors. And uh, underneath that arch is where they have their tomb of their unknown soldier. And uh, if you've ever been to Arlington Cemetery, it's one of the, one of the most, uh, I don't know, patriotic places to me is watching that, that honor guard as they stand in front of that, uh, that tomb. And, and in a sense, they had, they had a little ceremony that was taking place there, when we, at least when my group visited. But it's, it's, quite, the, it's quite a massive uh, structure. Paris is also home to one of the most famous, are lots of art museums. Of course, one of the most famous uh, pictures is the Mona Lisa. We had some that got a chance to go into the Louvre and to, to see that. And the reason the Mona Lisa is so famous, I don't know if you know this, it was because back about 100 years ago, it was stolen. It was stolen. And then um, it eventually got back there about nine months later, and of course it made it world famous, and that's why it's so famous now. But uh, anyways, it's, it also holds, that museum also holds something called the, the Misha Stone, which is a stone that was, that was written by a Moabite king that talks about biblical kings of Judah in it. It's one of the many artifacts that exist that prove the validity of the scriptures. We were hoping to get to the British Museum, which also holds a number of things like that too, but we were just didn't have enough time to do that. So that was our vacation part, if you will. Now it's to work. And uh, from Thursday on, we, we spent time together. We would, we would come together in morning in prayer, 
and uh, time for devotion and things like that. But then it was off to work. And uh, backpacks filled with tracks filled up <laughs> completely to the best of our ability, jumping on subways, going to different locations uh, throughout the city of Paris. And uh, this is up one of the, the streets. You would see just numerous people that would flood through it at certain, certain locations. And, it, and again, it was, it, was any, it was lots of different nations of people, not just Parisians, not just French people, but also from all over the place. Uh, fans and and sometimes athletes, sometimes their families, sometimes coaches, sometimes other types of personnel. And this area in particular is sort of the Fifth Avenue of Paris. It's where all the high-end shops were. Within a quarter of a mile, I was, we had a day where we were. I was over there, and within a quarter of a mile distance, I saw two Lamborghinis and a Ferrari. Just to give you an idea of the affluence that was in that area, and uh, it was one of the harder areas to work. Unfortunately, that's right near the Arc de Triomphe. But anyways, just loads and loads of people constantly going through. And we had opportunities like Jake had here. He's, he's talking to, actually he was an Englishman, I think. He was from, uh, from London, if I remember correctly. And he's having the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody here. And then we have one of the guys, he's, he's Tanner, he's from Fargo. Uh, he's sitting there talking with people and, and uh, talking with an individual here. He's got a track in his hand and so forth. Here's a Steph with an individual. I don't know if you remember where he's, this person was from or not, but Jordan, the country of Jordan. Okay, not the city of Jordan. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Just had to clarify that. Um, anyways, but uh, you have um, you had an individual there from the Middle East. Here, this guy was a former coach, I think, from a Russian, a former Russian satellite state. I can't quite remember which one. But uh, anyways, that was uh, Pastor Jonathan Perks and his family were part of that. And, uh, our group there, and here he's pictured with this individual. I'm up on top of the second floor of the Eiffel Tower, and I run into run into some Uzbek, some gymnasts, male gymnasts from the country of Uzbekistan, which was one of the former Soviet bloc countries, and got a chance to take a picture with them, give them some Russian tracks. I think that's the most that's one of the the, the most exciting things is be able to give somebody the gospel in their own language, and they're actually quite surprised sometimes, like whoa. I didn't expect that, you know. But, uh, but uh, these guys were cordial enough to take a picture with me and, of course, take, uh, take the tracks that we had. Here's another uh, individuals. I believe they caught these folks. Uh, the Perks family went home a day early, and this was at the airport where they intersected these types of people. Uh, this gal here, she's from Lehigh Valley Baptist Church out in PA, Pennsylvania. And I, I'll, I want to give you a brief testimony from her. She, one of the things we challenge people with is, is simply be asking God to pray. What can I pray for that you would do uh, while I'm on this trip? And, and some people would pray about different countries and so forth. Of course, we were praying to get over 100 nations. But Kristen here, she prayed about the country of Malawi. Now, from what she told us was that the country of Malawi, which is in Africa, um, one, of our, one, of the missionary, one of the missionaries that's out of the, her church is Doug Hammett who is, of course, in southern Africa and doing a lot of work throughout Malawi, Mozambique as well. But she, she said, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like God to enable, I'd like to reach somebody from Malawi. Well, there was only three athletes from Malawi there. And Malawi is pretty poor, one of the poorest countries in Africa. So there wasn't going to be a lot of tourists around. But I think it was the last day or the day before would you know it? She came across somebody from Malawi. Well, that's just luck, Pastor. <laughs> that's God. God answered that prayer. I mean, you got about how many millions of people, and you come across the very few people that are there from Malawi? That's only God. One of the exciting things about going on these excursions that we have is that we've seen God answer a specific prayer. This was, this was one that was just amazing to me mm -hmm. to think that, you know what, how did God, how, how could that happen without God doing something there in answer to prayer? And I thought that was just a, just a neat thing. Here we got Steph. I'm not sure you remember where they were from. They were from the country of South Africa. 
So we mean, you know, you got this is just a sample of all the different things, the different peoples that we came across, and we had all often see, well, the people reading tracks. This is just three of the many different pictures I have of people. After they get a track, they sit down and they start reading it and uh, look at it. We had a few people come back to us, different members of our group, and say, you know, I read that track. It was it was good, or, or they they made some kind of positive inference. To what they had read there. And this wasn't an uncommon thing. You know, one thing too, we noticed that the people that did take the tracks, a lot of them kept them. Now there was some, you'd end up with some on the ground or some in the garbage can, but I'll guarantee you not all 25,000 ended there. We, we knew that. Because we would see, we would go around and we'd pick up things. And uh, anyways, so I'm grateful for that. Uh, that uh, these doors would, would open. Another thing we were grateful for, there's a couple guys here. Uh, I don't know if you can see. Uh, f there's a guy in the middle there. He's being flanked by two other gentlemen. These were, these were young people from uh, the church there in, uh, in, in uh, Race Orange. There's about three of them, I think, that came out with us every, uh, multiple days, three or four of them. pastor came out, was able to come out with us one day. And, and I know he expressed great appreciation for... Um, just the opportunity to serve with us, and we enjoyed their company. And these these guys here were great to hang out with and to have with us. And uh, they, uh, we pray that it, it encouraged their their heart for God. We also had to be careful of the police. We had to rescue Frank here from. No, 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 just kidding. I just had to throw this one in there, Frank. But uh, we did, you know, there was a lot of security around. We knew that was going to be the case. And we didn't know how people, how they were going to respond to us. But for the most part, we had a few instances where we had some that weren't, were, kind of kicked people away from different places. But for the most part, they were very respectful. And I know we got, uh, got tracks to them and things like that. I mean, they, there was so many people coming. I know one of the biggest things was security in those types of situations. And you saw lots of different police, you saw military walking through the streets just to have a presence there to deter crime. And, and you know what? Thank God for that. But uh, for the most part, we, we had no issues with them. And I'm grateful that I actually, there was a few guys that came up to me and just asked what we were passing out. And I said that. And I, and I thanked them. I said, thank you for keeping us all safe. And, and I said, you know, uh, you know I, there, from my understanding, there hasn't been anything major that has happened. I said, yeah, we'd like to keep it that way. I said, I, I'm glad that you do. You know, and I think, you know, we need to be thankful for people who are trying to keep us safe. And uh, they're not the enemy, folks. They're not the enemy. The enemy are those that want to do, be destructive and hurt other people for whatever reason. And I thank God that we've had the opportunity to, to minister to even some of those folks as well. And, of course, uh, we got a, some opportunities to see some things. The Eiffel Tower lights up and glistens at night. That was a, a pretty neat thing to see. And one of the things I loved was the macrons. <laughs> That's my favorite macron right there. Uh, anyways, I had to throw that one in there just for good measure. But thank you for, for everybody back home here praying. And I know we had people who had uh, mentioned mentioned uh, that they were praying to us, whether they messaged us or, or various means. Thank you. That made all the difference. Um, as a, we had a lot, you know, there were some challenges that we, we had to endure. I mean, it was physically demanding uh, the days on our feet. It was, it was pretty warm there in the 80s. And I think the one day it was in the mid-90s, a little bit humid, you know, and we were on the streets in the shade, thankfully, that made it helpful. And and uh, for the most part, I don't think we had anybody fall out or anything like that. Everyone was smart and wise and, and uh, got as much rest as they could. And, uh, and we just attribute that to the grace of God at work. So thank you for praying for that. Tonight at 6.30, we'll have the, the team come up and, and uh, they'll give some testimonies of what God did in their life and, and things like that. So um, we just pray that God will bring much fruit. Uh, and through the efforts that took place there. Let's go ahead and go to Mark 16 with our remaining time that we have here this morning. Mark chapter number 16. The story is told about a barber who had just been gloriously saved in an old-fashioned revival meeting. The next morning at work, he wanted to share his new faith and witness to those who were unsaved. There was a customer who came in, and the barber began to, to give him a shave like they, like they did in those days. 
And he was, and that barber was just trying to muster up the right words to say. Finally, he he stood with his razor kind of poised over the man's throat, and he asked this question: "Are you prepared to meet God?" You know, the man's heart was in the right place. Maybe the timing might have been a little bit off on that. But are you prepared to meet God? Our church has a vision statement that goes something like this. Exalt the Lord, equip the laborers, evangelize the lost. In these past 12 days, we had a team walking up the streets of Paris, France, often under the shadow of the world's most iconic structures, with a passion to see people get the gospel message, and when possible, even in their own language. And our text is a familiar one to us. It's kind of right on our wall here, but I thought we need to look at our Bible. It would be a better place to start. Because it's our heart's desire here at Metropolitan Baptist Church to fulfill what is often referred to as the Great Commission. And part of the Great Commission is the goal of giving every person the possibility, the opportunity to hear the gospel message. Jesus said it so well here. John 16, 15. He said unto them, Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I'd like to spend a few moments here this morning and talking about why we preach the gospel. So let's pray and we'll get into that. Father, we're thankful today to be back home stateside. Thank you for the work that you did while we were in Paris. Thank you for those that uh, stood by the stuff here and kept things going and were faithful here, uh, being a support and a help and a blessing to the preachers that preach. Thank you for those people, Lord God. I'm so grateful for faithful people who love the Lord. And I just pray today that you would just encourage our hearts so that we may love and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, while in Paris, we would often engage in conversation with people about various things. That would come up occasionally, of course, why we were here. Of course, most would assume that we were there, well, of course, to watch the Olympics, watch Team USA, or watch some other team, or do something like that. But of course, oftentimes, we would share that, our no, that wasn't really why we were there. And it was met sometimes with, oh, okay, sure, whatever, you know to each their own, or sometimes it would be acquisitive type looks, or okay type responses. But I thought about our team. And I thought about what they had to do to get there. You know, each team member had to give up vacation time. You know, you don't get a whole lot of vacation time, do you? You don't have oodles and oodles of that. But there are people today in that team that gave up multiple days of their vacation time that they could have used for themselves. They had to spend $2,500 for their flight, their lodging, their transportation, their food, and that doesn't even include some of the things that they would have to buy on site. For the opportunity to walk up and down the streets as best as they could to hand out gospel tracts and engage in conversation. So, well, they went to Paris. Wasn't that kind of a vacation? Ask them, ask anybody on the team if they were on a vacation. I guarantee you they weren't. The weather for the past week was quite warm, and the group would often come back pretty tired. Say, why would anybody do that? Why would anybody do that? Now, that's a good question. But I'll tell you why. It's because God loves people and wants them to spend eternity with him. That's why. Bottom line. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's why. That's why we did that. That's why we do outreach here. Is because God wants people with him forever. Well, aren't most people going to go to heaven anyways? Not according to Jesus. Go to Matthew chapter number 7. Not according to Jesus. Jesus said here in Matthew chapter number 7, Enter ye into the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth to life, or heaven, and there be few that find it. 
What does he tell us here in that statement? He said, look, most people are on the road to destruction. That's speaking of hell. And there are many that go on there at. Because the way to heaven is straight and narrow. In other words, there's only one door to heaven. That's found through Jesus Christ. And not everyone's going through that door. Everyone's trying all these other doors except the one that God has built himself. And it says here there's few that, that find it. It's not that it's not available. It's just that few want to go through it. In fact, there are many who think that they will one day get, uh, who will think that they will enter heaven and will one day get the shock of their life when they find out that they missed it because they went in the wrong door. Look at verse 23. It says here, chapter 7, verse 21, excuse me. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Notice all these things that these people were doing. They preached in his name. That's, they did miracles in his name. They, they done many wonderful works. But they, de, they are denied entrance into heaven because they didn't go through the proper channel called Jesus Christ. Contrary to popular opinion, the Bible teaches us that there is only one plan, one door, one way to get to heaven, and it's found in Jesus Christ alone. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That phrase, that statement there is in, inclusive, or exclusive. In other words, there's no, I, I, he's not saying, I'm the best option. I'm, I'm a better option. I'm one of the options. He's saying, I'm the only option. I'm the only option. In a world that, that believes in pluralism and, and whatever you think truth is is truth, that's a bunch of nonsense. He said, I am the truth. I am the way. If you're going to come to the Father, it's going to be through me and me alone. That's what he's saying there, Jesus. See, the gospel message is simply God's plan of salvation. How one gets right with God and how one gets to heaven. We all are born in this state of condemnation because of our sin. In fact, you go to John chapter 3, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 3, what follows on the heels of um, verses, verse 16, it says, I'll, in fact, I'll read verse 16 again here in the text. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. See, we're all born in this state of condemnation because of sin. Jesus didn't come here to condemn the world. He came to save it from that condemnation that we're all under because of the curse of sin. See, our sin puts us at odds with God, and if that, those odds are not rectified, we cannot spend eternity with God in heaven. You can't. No matter how quote unquote good you may or may think may or may not think you are. The Bible says for God's or excuse me, John Revelation, I got my verses are messed up. That's what happens when I write on the plane, right? Let's go to John <laughs> Revelation twenty one. I'll get these right. Revelation twenty one, verse eight. It mentions here. The eternal state, we've been studying this at 9.30. And it mentions these are the people that are not in heaven, as it were. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Notice the, uh, the mention of, of people not in heaven. Verse 27 of the same chapter 
And there shall in no wise enter into anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. See, God cannot allow any sin into heaven at all. Zero, zilch, none. But we're sinful creatures. We've committed sin against God in word and thought and deed. And as sinners, we are naturally condemned because of our sin. Romans 5, 18 and 19, For God sent not as... Man, I am having a hard time with my verses today. Let's go to Romans 5. Romans 5. Verse 18, it says, Therefore, Romans 5, verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Again, notice here, because of the sin of Adam and Eve, We've all come under this state of condemnation because we've all become sinners. But thanks to Jesus Christ, we can all be made righteous. God made a way for our sins to be forgiven and our lives rescued from that condemnation. When Jesus went to the cross, he took our judgment upon himself instead of us being judged for our sin. In the process, he shed his blood, which is the only atonement that God accepts for sin. And we need to get that blood atonement upon the sin account that we have racked up against him over the years. The gospel message is simply the explanation of how we receive that blood atonement upon our life. Whether you realize it or not, every day we charge a sin account. We do something, say something, think something, and it's just, it's just like running your credit card through constantly in a shopping mall. Eventually, you know, the, over the course of time, it just continues to build up and build up and build up and build up and build up. But all you had to do was have one transaction of sin to be guilty of all, according to James 2.10. We're all sinful creatures who need to be forgiven and our sins washed away. And the only thing that can wash away sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ. The question is, how do you get that sin atonement, or that blood atonement upon our sin account? That's what the gospel message tells us. The gospel message, in essence, says this, that you must be born again. You must be saved, as it were. In order to be saved, you have to be willing to come to God Accepting the, these two terms. Number one, you must be willing to repent. To repent. And that means we come into agreement with God about our helpless, lost, condemned situation. We admit we have sinned against God. And with a heart of contrition, we acknowledge that truth of our situation and desire His forgiveness on the stipulation that going forward, I want to do my best with His help not to live like that, like I had before, but learn how to live the way he wants. It's a change of mind that results in a change of direction. It, it, it's really disturbing when you have people that say they get saved and then they just keep on living the way they used to with any, any ounce, no ounce of remorse. That person, I don't think, got it because they didn't mean business with God. When you repent, you mean business with God. You realize, I've offended God. I don't want to offend him anymore. <laughs> I mean, that's just the should be a natural inclination, right? When people are willing to repent, they recognize how serious sin is, and they're willing to and they're willing to go in a new direction. It doesn't mean they're going to be perfect and sin less, but they probably are going to sin a little less, right? They're not going to they're not going to continue to do things, and they're going to and God's going to grow them and show them more areas and, and so forth. But it's basically a willingness to go in a brand new direction. That's not so offensive to God. And of course, we have to acknowledge our wrong. Now, there's the faith aspect, too. We place 100% trust in Jesus Christ to pay for our sins completely instead of trusting ourselves. There are many different things that people are trusting in to get them to heaven. You know, 
how do you know what person is trusting in? Well, just ask them. Ask them this. You know, if you stood before the gates of heaven, why, what reason would you tell the gatekeeper? Everyone thinks it's St. Peter, but whoever. <laughs> you know, that's what's in the cartoons. Because that's truth, you know. Uh, <laughs> All right, whoever, Peter, we'll just say for the sake of argument, Peter. Peter asked, why should, you, why should I let you in? What would be your answer? That is really what it matters. What would be your answer? Maybe there's some here today who say, well, I, I've been a pretty good person. I haven't done, you know, certain things. And, you know, I've gone to church. And Can I say that it's the wrong answer? if that would be your answer? The right answer is this. I had a time in my life when I repented of my sin and placed my faith and trust in Jesus alone to pay for my sin. And I was born again just like Jesus said I was to be. And he's washed me away. And he's promised me entrance. So move aside, Peter. I'm going in. That's, that's, that's the right answer. But it also has to have happened in your life, too. You can't just say the right words. It's a matter of what has truly happened in your life. Have you had a time in your life when you have truly been saved or born again? That's what God wants. That's the gospel message. He wants to get out to every person. Because when a person comes to understand what they need to do, then there's only one thing left to do, and that is to call out and ask to be saved. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And of course, at that moment, that person's sins are completely forgiven. There's a, there's a renewed relationship with God and a guaranteed ticket to heaven as a result of that. Something that's never lost. You know, everyone is going to die one day. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Okay? We're all, we all have an appointment with death. Now most people don't think about that, and most people aren't as prepared as they think they are for that. We went to Paris, and we spread the gospel message there because we want people to be prepared for that day. We want people to experience a renewed relationship with God so that they can go to heaven and please the Lord while they live with this life. I believe a life void of a relationship with God leads to a meaningless existence and an awful, awful eternity. And people, in order to respond to it, need to have a chance to hear it. And then it's up to them to accept it or reject it. But we who are saved invest our lives into this kind of cause because according to the Bible, I don't believe there is a greater cause. If the Bible is true, which I do believe it is, there really is no greater cause than to try to help people get to heaven. Because you can make this life as nice and comfortable as it is, but this life will end in a moment's notice. And eternity will be forever. And if, a he- if there is a heaven and there's a hell, which I do believe there is based on what the Bible says, the worst place anybody could ever end up is hell. And the best thing anything could ever happen to them is heaven. And what's great is that you can, you can have messed up your life so bad, but if you can come to God on his terms as I outlined, he can save your soul and change your life and put you on that way. The sad thing is that there are some people who haven't necessarily messed up their life so bad, but because they're so self-righteous, they never come to him, and as a result, they won't be in heaven. I think one day it's going to be quite surprising who's walking those streets and who is not. All because of what they did or didn't do with the gospel message. Our text, John, or Mark 16, 15, comes from Jesus Christ himself, who is the Son of God, the creator of all. And in my book, again, I believe it's the greatest cause on planet Earth to get that gospel message out. Why do we preach the gospel? Even sacrificing time and expense? I'll tell you why. 
because death is certain, eternity is forever, heaven is real, and so is hell. God's gospel plan is the only way to get to heaven, and all other roads lead to hell. God loves people so much he died to reconcile all, but they can't be reconciled unless they hear and respond to the message of their own free will. We who have responded to that message are commissioned to get the message out, and God has promised great reward for all that do. Why do we get, or why do we preach the gospel? How can any serious, blood-bought, born-again Christian not? May God help us to be fervent in sharing God's love found in that gospel message to the world, wherever that might be. Amen. Let's take a few moments. Let's stand to our feet. Every head bowed and every eye closed. For As the pianist is going to come play here for a moment. Why do we preach the gospel? Why go to great expense, both here and to the lands beyond the seas? Well, it's because there are people that need to hear. God tells us to do it, so we go and we do it. We obey him. Because if we've been saved, we've got a testimony to share. And if you're not saved, God has a testimony you want to, He wants you to hear. He died so that you might be right with Him. That you might be saved. You might know for sure that heaven is your home. Tonight, or today, have you been saved? Do you know for sure if you were to die, you, everything is right between you and God? So well, I'll think about that later. You don't know if you have a later. I hate to break it to you. It's true. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. But that's why God wants us to be prepared today. Are you prepared? You know, if you're saved here today, thank God you've gotten prepared. But you know what? It doesn't end with your salvation. God wants you to, wants to use you to reach others. It starts in our Jerusalem here and expands to the world. Is there somebody today that God wants you to reach out to this week? I want to encourage you to do that. I encourage you to be obedient to what God is telling you to do. May we be found faithful in these days. Father, we're thankful today for the gospel message. Many here today can testify of, of receiving that message and, and embracing it. And, and we're so thankful for that. And Lord, I think about the folks that we reached out to there in Paris and, and just the great need in the country of France and really the other countries that we could talk about. We could spend hours and days and weeks just looking at every country and seeing the need. And Father, I pray today that there would be the raising up of laborers for the fields of the world, that you begin to really work in our lives and, and do what we can do here in our corner of the world, but also, Lord God, that you even begin to call out people and in a way that is christ honoring thank you lord god for the opportunity we have here to worship today in jesus name amen amen all right why don't you quick be seated we've got a drawing to do here quick and uh looks like we got about six names on there so mr neil i'll let you do the honors of tapping a little gizmo here okay here it goes the wheel is spinning see that and it's gonna land on oh, Diane. <laughs> I got a birthday coming up too, you know. No, just kidding. <laughs> well, enjoy it. Enjoy your gift card. And congratulations to those that, that finished it. And all a number of young kids did as well. If you didn't quite finish it, but I encourage you to just keep on. I mean, the, the main goal is to get through God's word. And get through the Old Testament, get through the New Testament, get through the Old Testament again. Just keep letting it saturate your life, and it'll change you from the inside out like nothing else could. And uh, that's why we have those scriptures. Well, tonight at 6.30, I really want to encourage you to come back. I think the testimonies uh, from the group will be uh, uh, great. As uh, We'll be talking about some things. They each will have a brief testimony about uh, what God did in their lives. 
and of course I'll have a little challenge at the end there as well. But uh, again, thank you everyone who prayed and uh, had an invested interest in what we were doing there. And uh, looking forward to the next project, a little, a little further off. Thank God I need a little breather <laughs> between Bangkok and, and this uh, being kind of close together. But uh, looking forward to what God has in store in Africa and beyond that. There are things in the works, don't worry. Uh, but they're excited to see what God's going to do uh, both here and, and far. So Neil, why don't you come and just close with a word of prayer today. Thank you. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for the just bringing everyone back safely and, and for all of, uh, everything that you did over in, in the uh, city of Paris over the last two weeks. Father, we just pray for uh, continued fruit from that, Lord, just that, uh, that the people that received the gospel would, uh, would understand it and, and believe it and that they would bring it back to, to their respective countries. And Father, I do just pray for, for this afternoon, Lord, that, uh, that we would just be seeking seeking you throughout this afternoon lord just preparing our our own hearts to hear from your word again this evening father i do just pray that you would bring us back safely tonight i uh, just thank you for it and pray all this in jesus name amen all right thank you for being here this morning you are dismissed <laughs>